Can you hear that? That is the sound of a hundred air source heat pumps not running. Hiya folks, welcome back to the show. I'm Andy Mack and we have been renovating this 1920s semi-detached property for the last six months or so. If you watched the last video, you'll have seen everything about the electrics and how bad things were and what we've had to do to turn things around on that side. And now today, we are gonna talk about the central heating. But I wanted to explain why in 2021, with a myriad of government grants and incentives and all sorts of other things, why we didn't end up going down the route of having like a ground source heat pump or an air source heat pump or something else like that, which is supposed to be more environmentally friendly. But I can tell you right now, we've looked into it in a lot of detail and we rapidly came to the conclusion that in our circumstances, in our situation and where we live, it would have been a bad decision. We pretty much had a blank canvas. The property had no central heating when we bought it. The only thing that it did have was storage heaters in a few of the rooms. So in 2021, there were really kind of four options open to us in terms of central heating for an older house that needs to be brought up to modern standards. And that was either a combi boiler, which is basically everything all in one in a single boiler that does your hot water, so instant hot water and central heating all in one box, which is the route that we went down. The other option is to go for like an unvented system where you've got a tank in the loft that heats up where your hot water is stored basically. And then of course, there's the option of things like a ground source heat pump or air source heat pump, which seems to be the kind of in thing that the government are trying to push us down the road of everyone getting one of these things. But honestly, I've heard so many bad stories about them to the point that uh, I know <laughs> around the corner they were running some sort of incentive scheme for new builds to let people in new builds get air source heat pumps. And there was so little take up of it that I think they ended up having to shut the scheme down. They literally couldn't give them away. This was quite an interesting one when I looked into it because I know people at the council who told me kind of the inside scoop on this. Uh, it was called the Electrification of Heat Project, upgrading over 300 homes to a clean, green and cost-efficient system for free. You see, it says it's free, free central heating system in partnership with E.ON. Oh, well, that would be a massive turn off for me straight away. Our Electrification of Heat Project aims to show the feasibility of a large scale rollout of new heat pump technology in Great Britain. Well, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> it's a partnership with E.ON. Oh my word, literally the worst company that I've ever dealt with in my life. In 2020 to 21, we provided full funding to support more than 300 households in Newcastle. Well, this is funny as. So I found this Home Energy Conservation Act progress report from 2021, and I'm assuming that's an update on this project. I'm not 100%. But what I did find in that report written by Newcastle City Council, 20,428 letters have been issued to identify suitable properties in Newcastle for free installation of air source heat pumps. From what I can understand, 4,499 letters were sent out targeted at properties we identified that could benefit from the scheme. So in other words, only a quarter of the 20,000 letters that they sent out, only a quarter would have even benefited from the scheme. Your Homes Newcastle have targeted 83 customers, which presumably is out of the 4,499, and to date, three properties have taken up the offer <laughs> to have the air source heat pumps installed. Well done, Newcastle Council. I would suggest part of your problem is working with E.ON. <laughs> and by the way, we haven't even got onto the grant thing yet. I found the grant thing so incredibly complicated because this is referring to the Green Homes grant, but when I went on, there was like another different grant system. And when I went onto their, their website, it, was, it wasn't a one-off payment. It was like spread over 10 years or something. So you weren't getting an upfront payment to cover the cost of your uh, air source heat pump or whatever you decided you wanted to put in. You still had to stump up the initial money and then you would gradually get drip fed a, a grant 
like a payment every year or something like that back to you it just sounded awful either way we did look into the grant thing and we couldn't work out for the life of us how it worked it was just so complicated we gave up on it and plus you've got to use certified installers and there were hardly any certified installers in the northeast i think there was only like five or something I generally take government hype with this sort of stuff with a pinch of salt because we were the ones who bought diesel cars back in the day when the government were really doing the push on diesel cars and to the point that our diesel car is tax free because it's so environmentally friendly and now of course they've decided that diesel cars are the worst thing in the world so I really take all of this sort of stuff with a pinch of salt because the government changed their mind on it every two minutes but to explain why we ended up going down the combi boiler route I think we need to talk about the weather so it's probably best if we explain that if I take you on a little wander down the garden all of this will be explained on a future videos so don't forget to hit subscribe if you're wondering what on earth is going on over here I'm gonna sit on what's left of our birch tree it's a bit sheltered over here hopefully the wind noise isn't too bad you see we live in the northeast of England and if you're not aware the northeast of England it never gets particularly cold although a lot of people would disagree with that but it never gets crazy cold and it never gets crazy warm and as a good example of that it's towards the end of September now and I'm still in a t-shirt and it's a nice kind of comfortable 20 21 degrees now admittedly we are experiencing a little bit of an Indian summer at the moment so this is probably a little bit unusual having said that we do sometimes get extremes of temperature uh, I've sometimes seen in May June time I've sometimes seen the temperature go as high as 32 degrees and over the winter time it's not uncommon to occasionally get the odd day of minus five maybe minus seven or minus eight i don't remember the last time i've seen anything colder than that but it does mean that you need some form of spot heat throughout the winter months so that you can just turn on a fire or something like that quickly if you've come in from a walk and you're cold and you're damp and you just want a little bit of extra heat it's nice to be able to thaw out around the fire but my point is is that for the best part of six months of the year the central heating's turned off completely and for the rest of the year a small gas boiler does the job along with something like a wood burning stove or maybe an electric fire or a gas fire or whatever in the living room just for that kind of secondary heat source that you might want to just switch on as and when you need it so what's this all got to do with the central heating i hear you ask well hello you're not in youtube for another few episodes yet so i can't tell youtube about you my point is is that since the central heating was installed back in kind of may time it hasn't been on at all it literally hasn't been switched on the only thing it's been getting used for is hot water because in the uk we have really or certainly in this part of the uk we have no need for aircon because it never gets warm enough and throughout the summer months the central heating is just off so the house generally stays at a comfortable temperature all by itself and by the way contrary to popular belief as well the northeast of england is actually a very dry part of the uk we're in what's known as the rain shadow of the pennines which means that most of the rain that blows across from the atlantic um, gets kind of used up on the lake district and the, the west side of the country and by the time everything gets over to the east side everything tends to have dried up i mean admittedly i am sitting kind of under a tree here but i don't know if you can see the ground is literally like dust even out in the open section of the garden here where there's nothing sheltering it you can see the ground is just like concrete so it's clay soil that's just gone absolutely solid from us walking on it but you can tell just from that how much rain we get we don't get that much rain at all of course i jinxed it and 24 hours later it was absolutely tipping it down but i'm glad to say my temporary rainwater downpipes have been working very well so I'll talk you through the four central heating options I mentioned earlier and I'll explain why we went down the route we did. In case you're not aware, this is a small three bedroom semi-detached house built in the 1920s. It's a very typical UK property. First of all, I know a lot of you suggested we go for an unvented system. An unvented system is basically like a traditional central heating system with an insulated cylinder to store the hot water. 
but with the added benefit of operating from mains water pressure, so it doesn't need a header tank in the loft. I'll be honest, we lived with an unvented system in our new build for seven years, and it was a nightmare. It cost a fortune to run, and we were constantly running out of hot water. I think we had a 220 litre tank, so that means at 10 litres per minute, you burn through all of your hot water in 22 minutes, which was just about enough for a five minute shower each in the morning. And of course, once you've run out of hot water, you've got about a two hour wait for it to heat up again. We had numerous boiler problems and the zone valves failed three times in seven years. Sorry, I know a lot of you like these systems, but we just don't. Secondly, ground source heat pumps, and this is where you need to bury 400 miles of pipework in your back garden and hope that the temperature differential is enough to heat your house over a cold winter, which it generally isn't. From everything I've read, even our 500 square metre back garden wouldn't be big enough for the system to work properly, not to mention the expense and hassle of digging up your entire back garden. Not happening. Then there's air source heat pumps, and this is a big subject. This is where you bolt what looks like a giant air conditioning unit to the back of your property and hope that the temperature differential is sufficient to heat your house over a cold winter, which generally it isn't. In addition to the fact that it simply can't handle cold winters, the system is so inefficient that you need to have much bigger radiators and wider bore pipework to compensate for everything running at a much lower temperature. If it can't cope, which it absolutely won't on colder northeast winters, days you need to heat your entire house using electricity and likewise if your water doesn't get hot enough which it absolutely won't on colder northeast winter days you'll need to use an immersion heater and in addition to this you need to put up with the noise of the unit running 24 7 in the middle of winter obviously if you're out in the middle of nowhere with no one to disturb that's fine but can you imagine the noise from a housing estate with 200 of these things running at the same time and that's if the electricity grid can even handle that sort of demand over the winter months my home farm have a really good blog covering all this sort of stuff and they've actually done a really good honest review of their experience they said on their coldest day over winter it was three degrees which isn't that cold it'll get much colder than that up here on that day they used 66 kilowatt hours of electricity to drive their air source heat pump in other words it was too cold for the heat pump to do anything so they used 66 kilowatt hours of electricity from the grid to make everything work 95 percent for central heating and five percent for hot water so that's over 10 pounds a day at current rates on electricity and interestingly that's about four times less efficient than our gas boiler was just for the hot water but it's not all negative. I got in touch with my home farm and asked them for a bit of an update of how things were going with their air source heat pump and Mars very, very kindly got back to me and this is what they said. We installed an air source heat pump three years ago and we are heading into our third winter. The learning curve has been quite steep because heat pumps are slow burners as opposed to running at a high temperature like oil or gas burners. There are a few things that you should take into consideration when retrofitting a heat pump into a period property. Insulation is very important to ensure the heat pump is running efficiently because you don't want to be leaking heat. Another thing we discovered in February this year when temperatures hit minus 6 is the importance of having radiators sized correctly for your rooms because of the low flow rates in the pump systems. We had a few undersized radiators in some key rooms and they wouldn't stay warm when temperatures plummeted to below zero. We replaced these with K3 radiators from Stellrad and it's made a massive difference. These rooms are now the warmest by far and our heat pump is set to keep us warm and snug this winter. All in all, with the right tweaks, we would recommend that homeowners consider installing heat pumps in an attempt to decarbonize their homes. In our case, we are no longer burning through thousands of litres of kerosene to heat our house. A massive thank you to my home farm. I'll link to their channel and to their website down in the description below. You can visit myhomefarm.co.uk and you can read all about their experience with heat pumps and their sustainable journey. So I decided to open this up to you guys and get some honest comments from the Gosforth Handyman audience on YouTube and I asked the question, what are your honest experiences of this? And this is just a selection of the answers. I've really tried to keep it as balanced as possible. PG said that they were quote, 11,400 pounds recently subject to survey for the install of an air source heat pump system and that was for a new build that's for a house that's already really thermally efficient and it already has underfloor heating here's an interesting one from effervescence my company fits them they're good in buildings designed for them but we wouldn't recommend them north of cardiff 
We are very much north of Cardiff, by the way. They just aren't cost efficient to run, and that's from someone who installs them. Over the last two years, we've actually been asked to rip out over a dozen of them and replace them with normal gas boilers. We were part of the scheme that was offering people a grant and free upgrade, well, I've already talked about my experience with the grant process, to remove their fossil fuel appliance and replace it with air source heat pump, but there was only about 60 uptakers nationwide out of 2,000 allocations. James said I had one fitted in one of my well insulated rental properties had a few problems with it there is very little saving over the year and the noise has been a problem with other neighbors in the block complaining richard in paris i've had one in my apartment in paris for three years a compressor on the balcony but hardly visible as i'm on the sixth floor says it's extremely quiet replaced a 24 kilowatt combi boiler from 2000 Two. Winters are not that cold here, rarely below one degree, so they're a fair bit warmer than the northeast of England. No problem, costs about the same to run as the old gas system, but yeah, the gas system was from 2002, so that wouldn't have been a particularly efficient boiler. Boilers now, gas boilers are so efficient now, um, it's really, you can't really compare that. And just to offer some balance, a positive comment from Paul Clark, we've had an air source heat pump for five years in a 1950s house, and it's brilliant. Most radiators had to be resized, but the installers understood the calculations about solar gain and heat loss, and it all works brilliantly. Our lucky bill for a four-bedroom house, including a commuting electric car, is £100 per month throughout the year. That's about half our previous fuel bill, which included heating oil. Okay, so they were on uh, an oil central heating system before. So... Yeah, maybe that's viable then. If, if you're switching over from oil and gas isn't an option, maybe uh, air source heat pumps is the way to go. You have to change your mindset a bit because the system works by keeping the thermal mass. Yeah, I, I do get the mindset change, but man, there's, <laughs> there's mindset change and there's also just properties that it's simply not suitable for. And I would say it's the vast majority of properties out there. This just isn't right for them. And finally, Mr. Jib said, I bought a new build in 2013 with an air source heat pump. It failed after about four years. He says it was really difficult to find qualified technicians in Bristol and as a result, it never got serviced properly. We moved house 2019, a motivating factor being the uncertainty of whether we could get it fixed if it failed midwinter. Spoke to our old neighbour a few weeks ago. The new owner has had it completely removed and replaced with a conventional system. So even though they got it effectively for free as part of the purchase price of the house, so they, they, they paid for it effectively, and they've still had it ripped out and just gone back to a normal system because it just didn't work. And again, that was in a new build, a 2013 new build, only an eight-year-old house. As per usual, thanks for all your feedback. You have been awesome. So look, here's my take on the whole situation, and it's a complicated one, and this video is already ending up ridiculously long. Are heat pumps a good idea? Yes, potentially they are a good idea in the right situation. So if you've got a house out in the middle of nowhere and you need to replace your old oil central heating system, it absolutely makes sense to consider either a ground source heat pump if you've got enough land or an air source heat pump, assuming the noise of the pump isn't going to disturb people too much. But it is absolutely not a replacement for gas boilers by any stretch of the imagination. And at the moment, anyway, the whole debate over heat pumps versus, for example, hydrogen, it's the VHS beta max debate all over again. You know, you could end up going down the heat pump route and then it turns out that hydrogen boilers get rolled out into all new new builds and you're going to find it very difficult to find an engineer to look after your heat pump system if that happens. It doesn't mean that heat pumps are going to become obsolete because I think there's always scenarios where heat pumps would win over hydrogen. For example, if you are in the middle of the countryside and stuff like that, heat pumps make sense. And certainly some of the comments about people living in like tower blocks or apartments in the middle of a city where there's a constant kind of hum of the city anyway, then the noise of a heat pump, no one's going to care. But if you're out kind of in suburbia in a housing estate where you might have like 200 houses all in quite close proximity to each other and you don't have the background noise of the city to disguise the sound of 200 heat pumps running, 
then that could be a real problem. But I'll tell you right now, the blanket approach that the government are taking, where they're basically trying to say everyone needs to use heat pumps, everyone needs to ditch their gas boilers, it's exactly the route that they went down with diesel cars like 10, 15 years ago or thereabouts where they said everyone needs to switch to diesel cars and then within like five years diesel was worse than the devil. And the other thing as well is if you end up putting an air source heat pump in a property where it's just not suitable then the carbon footprint is potentially going to be much much higher than going down the gas boiler route because as I say gas boilers are very very efficient. If you look at the overall carbon footprint of making the air source heat pump and all the associated gubbins that goes with it and the insulation and everything else, the overall carbon footprint will be way higher than what you save by just staying on gas. And I'll tell you another thing that I find incredibly frustrating when I'm walking through new build housing estates and stuff like that where you've got these ultra efficient, really well insulated homes and you're walking through these estates in the middle of winter, it'll be like two or three degrees outside and half the houses have the windows open because they don't know how to operate a thermostat. That's what we're dealing with here. So do you genuinely think that if these property owners who don't know how to operate a thermostat, do you honestly think they're going to be able to cope with the complexities of an air source heat pump system? No, of course they're not. And in a lot of situations, the best thing that people can do is just to turn the temperature dial down a little bit and pop a hoodie on. That's what we do when it gets cold in the house. We don't turn the central heating up. On the few days a year that it might be minus 20 degrees outside, we'll pop a little cardigan on or something like that. And by the way, I've never really talked about it that much on this channel, but part of what we're doing in this renovation is to really go, it's not off grid by any stretch of the imagination, we still live in the city, but you know, we can't move out the city yet because we've, we've got kids at school, it wouldn't be fair on our kids to take them off into the countryside and, you know, set up a homestead or something like that. We would love to do that later in life. In fact, we absolutely watch this space, folks. We have a slightly different view on life, probably to most people. And that is that going down like the heat pump route, it's not a single answer to sort everything out. You've got to look, if you if you really want to get into the sustainability thing, and by the way, sorry to break it to you, but 90% of people just don't care. And they've become very tired of the relentless message on, on climate change and all that sort of thing. But we do genuinely want to kind of make a difference. And we have done a lot to this property to make a difference. It's not just about saving money. It's not just about making the property low maintenance, but it is genuinely about, you know, trying to do the right thing. But from our perspective, you've got to kind of view it as a package of measures. You can't view it as just one single thing that you're gonna do, like installing a heat pump. You've got to look at it at things like underfloor insulation, if it's possible, loft insulation, maybe looking at the whole spray foam insulation in a bit more detail to try and bust some of the myths surrounding that. I mean, the fact that we're saying in the UK, you potentially can't get a mortgage if you've got spray foam insulation in your loft, when in America, spray foam insulation is used routinely. So something's not adding up there. Someone needs to do some proper research on that because we've found it's actually working really, really well. And there's no sign of any problems whatsoever with the woodwork in our loft space. There's other things such as wood burning stoves. And again, a lot of misinformation surrounding that. Wood burning stoves are largely carbon neutral if you're burning wood that was gonna get cut down anyway, because the wood releases CO2 as it decomposes. So you might as well make use of that as an energy source, as long as you've got a good, clean and efficient wood burning stove. A lot of the older ones aren't and a lot of people just don't know how to use wood burning stoves properly as well. That's another part of the problem. The things like having less holidays or having less cars or having more environmentally friendly cars, not necessarily an electric car because making an electric car has a massive environmental impact on the chemicals and everything that are used to make the batteries, for example. So it doesn't make sense in our situation to ditch a perfectly good 
diesel car that is actually, it runs very, very efficiently, you know, like 70 mile to the gallon or something like that. Our carbon footprint would go through the roof if we were to buy an electric car at the moment when we've got a perfectly functional diesel car that we hardly ever use because we hardly ever drive anywhere. There's other things as well, like buying less blooming disposable furniture. I've completely stopped shopping at Ikea. I'm sick of putting Ikea rubbish in the bin that just nothing can be done with it. It's plastic coated paper and chipboard. So we're really going down the route of more sustainable furniture for this property where it's solid wood, stuff that's actually gonna last for potentially the lifetime of the property as opposed to buying disposable furniture all the time. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Ikea, but I'm saying at our time in our life, we're now at the point that we can make that decision. Whereas if you're only just moving into your first property or something, of course you're going to go to Ikea and buy as much cheap furniture as you can possibly buy because you can't afford solid wood desks and stuff like that. My whole point is that there's not a single answer to this. There's not a catch-all solution. You've got to look at a, a package of measures. If you are interested in sustainability, you've got to look at a package of measures that fits your lifestyle, fits a kind of property that you live in, fits your climate. Otherwise, your overall carbon footprint's just gonna be higher. Anyway, it's an interesting topic and I don't think there are any kind of right and wrong answers, but do post your experiences and your thoughts down in the comments below. So that was a kind of long drawn out way of saying that we went for a combi boiler. And this is, it's got to be one of the most de facto standard combi boilers in the UK. It's a Worcester Bosch. 36 CDI, so it's a 36 kilowatt combi boiler, so it's a top of the range in terms of uh, power output, but really that is the central heating system. It's a boiler small enough that it'll fit in a single kitchen cupboard and it does everything you need it to do. There is nothing else in the system to service other than this boiler. There's no zone valves, there's no pumps or anything like that. It's just beautifully simple and the thing that I really like about this is that we really have reached the pinnacle of efficiency when it comes to this sort of gear. And just at the point that we hit the pinnacle of efficiency, we're now trying to move people away from it. Just to give you a very quick crash course on how a combi boiler works, we've basically got gas comes in in the middle here. So this is a gas supply in. We've got a water supply that comes in at the top there. So that's the water supply coming in there and then Hot water comes out for your taps and showers and stuff. So that's your hot water output. We've got a cold water through, so you can kind of ignore that one. And then we've just got a flow and return for the central heating, for the radiators. And because this is a condensing boiler, we've got the condensate pipe here, where the water that comes out the boiler drains off into, well, into the drains. And if you're not aware, the big benefit of a combi boiler over a tanked system or vented system or any sort of air source or ground source system is that we aren't storing hot water that probably won't get used 90% of the time. So it's far more efficient. We're not unnecessarily storing hot water that isn't going to get used. And when you switch the tap on, the boiler immediately springs into life. And within a couple of seconds, we've got red hot water coming out the tap. When you switch the tap back off, you see the boiler's gone back off. And to me, that always seemed like the, the biggest no-brainer about a combi boiler is that you're not heating up 220 litres of water just to fill a sink to do the dishes or whatever. By the way, ignore all the stuff down here because we are mid-renovation. Do subscribe to the channel and you can follow our renovation project and you can see what we're, we're doing with this property. But there's gonna be a wall coming along here and the thermostat and the fuse per will be in that wall once the wall's built, but it's just temporarily there for the minute. We went for the Bosch Easy Control Smart Thermostat. We're not a huge fan of smart controls and stuff like that, but the Easy Control, it is actually quite nice. It uh, has like a motion sensor on, so you don't even have to touch it. So if I put my hand at the front there, it tells us what the current weather is outside, so 13 degrees outside. And then you can see here, internal temperature is 21 and a half degrees, and the boiler is set to come on at 19 degrees. So, 
13 degrees outside and 21 and a half degrees in here and we haven't even had the central heating on. If you want, you can integrate this with a smartphone app as well and you can control the central heating from your smartphone. It's got, because it's got the motion detection thing in, I think it detects if no one's been around like walking past it for a while and it'll enter holiday mode automatically and stuff like that. So, oh, you can set that sort of stuff up. I'm not particularly bothered about that. We generally set up a schedule for what we want the house temperature to be and we very rarely deviate from that. But because the house is so well insulated, it never really gets that cold anyway. And then again, because the boiler is so efficient and it puts out really hot water into the radiators, you don't need particularly big radiators. This is our hall radiator. This provides enough heat to heat up the downstairs and upstairs hall. We've got no upstairs radiator in the hall. There's nowhere to put one, but we just don't need one. The heat from here rises upstairs absolutely fine. And then all of the radiators have what's known as TRVs on. So this is a thermostatic radiator valve. You basically set this to whatever temperature you want. Normally, I mean, it, it's a bit of an arbitrary scale. So when you first get your central heating system up and running, it's a case of just setting your TRVs to a, a comfortable temperature. Normally you set it to three or two for bedrooms, maybe four-ish for living rooms and, and stuff like that. Here, because we're right in the middle of the house, I'm just gonna leave that fully open. But yeah, these TRVs just give you an, an element of kind of room level control over the central heating. Again, you can get smart devices now and I've been offered smart devices for free as part of this channel, but I don't want them. You, once you've set the temperature on this, you never touch it. I, I, you, <laughs> I don't know of anyone who goes around changing their TRVs every two minutes. You just set it to a temperature and you just leave it. And by the way, I'm not gonna give you any spoilers of the bathroom quite yet, but uh, the shower is insanely powerful. The shower through this boiler, with it being a 36 kilowatt boiler, I think it's 24 kilowatt on the hot water and 36 kilowatt on the central heating. Either way, it gives a hot water flow rate, I think, of 13 liters per minute, but that's of red hot water. So once you mix that with your mains water pressure, you get showers in the region of at least 20 liters per minute or, or thereabouts. So you're getting really powerful showers from this to the point that we've got a grower bar mixer shower and it's got a limiter on it to limit the water pressure and we never use it past the limiter because <laughs> when you turn it past the limiter, it physically hurts your skin. It's coming out with such pressure. And that's largely thanks to the fact that we replaced the water supply in this property and put in a brand new water supply. If you've followed previous videos, you will be aware that we did originally discuss fitting underfloor heating. But we actually ended up deciding against that because it was going to complicate the build quite substantially. It would have meant that all of our downstairs floors that we need to get access underneath for running pipe work and electrics and all of that sort of thing, we were going to lose that access um, quite early on in the renovation and it was going to cause some quite major setbacks and complications. So again, because the system is so efficient and when the house does get cold, the central heating only has to come on for a very short period of time and the house is suddenly warm again. Rather than spending a fortune on an air source heat pump, we decided, well, the combi boiler, in case you're wondering, the entire central heating system cost about three and a half grand and that was everything. The boiler itself was about 1200 quid. There was then all the radiators, all the pipework, the installation, uh, obviously the thermostat, the wiring, all that sort of stuff. The whole installation, every single bit of the installation was about three and a half grand all in. And that's versus probably a minimum of 10 grand for an air source heat pump. And I've seen people getting quoted 60 grand for a ground source heat pump. Absolutely insane. So the money that we've saved by putting in a bog standard combi boiler, we've spent that spare money, well, it's not spare money, but we've spent that money on insulation. And we've really gone all out on making this property as thermally efficient as possible. And time will tell how well it works, but as you've probably seen in other videos, we've insulated under all of the floors. We've got spray foam insulation in the loft, plus regular insulation as well, and we've beefed up the regular insulation. 
the house is unbelievably toasty warm. I know a lot of you aren't keen on spray foam insulation, by the way. I think there's a lot of myths surrounding that, to be honest. I can certainly see spray foam being a problem if you fit it onto a roof that's already leaking because it can trap the water uh, between the foam and the rafters. But our roof has got really good uh, salting felt on it, so there's no water getting trapped between the foam and the rafters, and the rafters are all in perfect condition. So time will tell. In America, they've been using spray foam insulation for years and years, and I don't think it causes any rafter rot or like timber rot or anything like that. Correct me in the comments below if I am wrong. In addition to that, we have replaced all of the windows with the most thermally efficient double glazing that we can get our hands on for a reasonable price. We've already got cavity wall insulation, so the walls are all pretty much as thermally efficient as they can be. I've insulated the eaves, so where the ceiling comes down at an angle into the bedroom, all of those have been insulated. And we've got an A-rated wood-burning stove as well. It's highly efficient. The modern wood-burning stoves, I think this is 83% efficient, which is amazing for a wood-burning stove. And that just gives us that nice kind of uh, secondary heat source in the event that you come in after a, a cold day out, a cold walk out or something like that, and you just want to put the fire on and sit and relax in front of the fire, you've got that. And with the heat that this pumps out, the central heating can be switched off completely. I'm gonna talk about the wood burning stove in more detail on a future video. So watch this space, but yeah, this thing is amazing. So there you go, folks. I hope that all makes sense. The combi boiler, we've lived with combi boilers in many properties before and they've always been great and we're very, very happy with it. But this is the problem where governments try to get involved to try and cure all of the world's problems with one simple solution. And there uh, rarely is one simple solution. What will work really well for one type of property will be a really, really bad idea for another type of property. So I'm certainly not saying that air source heat pumps are bad and ground source heat pumps. There are many situations where they can work really well, but I'm just saying for us and our particular circumstances, it just wouldn't have made sense, either economically or practically. It would have been a disaster for this property. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. This is potentially quite a thorny subject and I'm sure the comments will get interesting. But you've got to understand, I'm approaching 50 and I've been there before where the government have said one thing and then a couple of years later, they've literally said the exact opposite. I just don't believe them anymore at all on pretty much anything that they say ever. But we don't get into politics on this channel. And one other thing I forgot to mention as well, if you are wondering how much this whole renovation cost, I am gonna briefly discuss it on the public channel, but I've made a video on the member zone where I go into the renovation costs in a lot of detail, where I break down everything and you can see how much we've spent on this project in total. So if you want to know about that and you can't wait for the information to come out on the public channel, and as I say, the stuff that I put on the public channel won't be as detailed as the information that's on the member zone. So if you want to know about that straight away, you can sign up at members.gosforthandyman.com. It's a subscription-based service. It kind of keeps this channel running in the event that YouTube goes belly up, which wouldn't surprise me because the whole world has gone very weird over the last couple of years. Anyway, on that note, be kind, be nice, look after one another, and I shall see you next time. Tatty bye.